Thank you, everybody, for coming, despite the fantastic weather that we've got at the moment. Um, I'm going to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we can have questions and a discussion afterwards. Um, OK, so I'm going to start today's talk by asking you a question about physical and mental health that was posed by a monk writing in Canterbury in the 12th century. He said, what is easier, to give health of the mind or health of the body? This monk went on to recount a miracle that he believed was performed by St. Thomas Becket, whose remains were interred in Canterbury Cathedral. So he wrote, um, St. Thomas Becket, who brought light to these corporeal eyes, also restored a youth of Fordwich, Henry, to his mind. He had been insane for some days and had inflicted an unexpected wound of suffering upon his friends. He was hauled to the saint with his hands tied behind his back. He was presented to the saint, although he struggled and cried out. He raved there all day, but as the light of the sun receded, the light of reason, little by little, began to be restored. He spent the night in the church. The next day, his sanity returned. Um, so Henry of Fordwich was a madman who was believed to have been miraculously cured by St. Thomas Becket um, when, in the early 1170s, he was brought to the tomb in Canterbury Cathedral. His story was made known to the monks of Christchurch Cathedral Priory and recorded in one of two 12th century miracle collections that contain the records of more than 700 miracles attributed to the saint. In the miracle collection, the record of Henry's cure follows that of Robert of Thanet, who was a blind man who was miraculously restored to his sight. And his are the corporeal eyes um, that are referred to at the beginning of Henry's miracle, where a comparison is made between physical and mental healing. It's notable that for the monk who recorded this, the mind was not part of the body as the eyes were. So he's saying the, the, um, the blindness was a physical bodily complaint, but this is something different. Um, he made a clear distinction between insanity as a condition of the mind, or we might say a mental illness, and blindness as a condition of the body. Um, of course, Thomas Beckett was capable of curing both physical and mental illnesses and impairments. Within 50 years of its recording, Henry's miraculous healing had been immortalised in stained glass as part of a series of miracle windows that were produced to surround Beckett's new shrine behind the high altar, where his remains were moved from their original tomb in the crypt. And you can see the candle marks the spot where the shrine once stood, and these are some of the windows that surround it, and they go all the way around the, um, the east end of the church. So we'll zoom in on Henry's one. Here we are. And apologies that the photo is slightly tipped back, but it's really high up, so it's quite hard to take a picture of. Um, so 800 years on, this stained glass representation of Henry can still be seen in two roundels in Canterbury Cathedral's Trinity Chapel, the easternmost part of the cathedral, where Becket's shrine stood until the dissolution of the monasteries in the mid-16th century. Um, there is a Latin inscription, but... Um, it's really high, so it's quite hard to read, and lots of the medieval pilgrims who may have visited would have been illiterate anyway. So regardless, even if you can't read the inscription, um, it's quite clear to see that Henry is mad and then returns to, in, to sanity. Um, as in the miracle record on which this miracle window is based, um, in the first one, where he's mad, his, Henry, this is him, his hands are bound behind his back, and he's restrained by two men who are holding clubs, which you can see there. Um, you'll also notice that his cloak is dishevelled and kind of hanging the wrong way over his shoulder. Um, in the second roundel, which is after he's been cured, he's kneeling beside Ge Beckett's tomb to give thanks. Um, his cloak is nicely hanging down his back. And you can see that the rope and sticks, which were previously used to restrain him, are discarded at the bottom of the panel because they're no longer necessary. In today's talk, I'm going to explore what made someone like Henry mad. 
We'll examine madness through records of miracles, like Henry's, that were made at Thomas Beckett's shrine in Canterbury. Now, please remember that, except for a small minority of cases uh, where some indiscretion on the part of the supplicant meant, was, meant that healing was denied, these miracle collections only contain the accounts of those pilgrims who were successfully healed, and not of countless others who may have come to the shrine searching for a cure. So we have a patchy picture of those who actually visited Canterbury. Um, nonetheless, several mad men, women and children were brought, sometimes forcibly, to Thomas Beckett's shrine by concerned and even desperate parents, friends or members of the wider community. Many were purportedly made miraculously sane. We're going to look at what signs indicated to others that a person was insane and at how madness was distinguished from other illnesses, particularly epilepsy, which could be symptomatically similar. Who was affected by madness? What caused their insanity? And how could the monks and bystanders recognise when a miraculous cure had taken place? So to give you a little bit of context, um, I'm sure some of you who have come from the cathedral <laughs> will know this already, but for those of you who don't, St. Thomas Becket, who performed Henry's miraculous cure, was arguably, arguably the most famous English saint of the Middle Ages. On the 29th of December, 1170, Becket, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, was murdered in the cathedral by four knights who claimed they were acting on the orders of King Henry II. So you can see them there attacking him with a sword. Becket's career as an archbishop had been turbulent. He'd spent two of the eight years of his archbishopric in exile following disputes with the king over jurisdiction. For this reason, Becket's relationship with the monks at Christchurch was far from warm. So not only um, was he rarely in Canterbury, but the monks also resented Becket's efforts to boost the position of the secular clergy in England. Um, and they didn't appreci appreciate his appointment as archbishop by the king, because they argued that as the archbishop was also their abbot, the right to elect him should have been theirs. Um, and they were also found it hard to empathise with a man who had been ordained a priest only one day before he was made archbishop. So they didn't think he was very committed to the monastic lifestyle. Um, when the archbishop was murdered, there was no immediate consensus that he had died as a martyr. It was only when, on the 30th of December, the ecclesiastical robes were removed from the body in preparation for burial and coarse monastic garments riddled with lice and worms, which is a good sign because it shows that he was not indulging in earthly washing and things like that, um, were discovered underneath that the monks of Christchurch witnessed a potential sign of Becket's hidden asceticism and began to suspect that the archbishop, who had always been aloof, may have been one of them all along. Miracles started to occur within days of Becket's death and the first miracles were performed using the blood he had spilt in the cathedral. Uh, the cult grew rapidly and under considerable public pressure, Pope Alexander III issued a bull of canonization at Segni in Italy on the 21st of February, 1173. That's quite a fast turnaround for medieval canonizations. Um, on the 12th of July, 1174, Henry II came to Canterbury to do public penance for the death of his former rival. So Becket's tomb, which is still in the crypt at this point, because um, it's not moved up into the main church until um, 50 years after his death, was open to the public after Easter 1171, and the monks of Christchurch Cathedral Priory um, were in charge of the cult's administration, the management of the pilgrims, and care of the sick. Uh, monks are frequently pictured in the windows, if you look at the stained glass in Canterbury Cathedral. So we've got one here in his monastic robe holding a bowl, but you'll see them all over the windows. Two custodians of the shrine compiled the records of the miracles that were performed there. Um, the first one was Benedict of Peterborough, and he collected records for the shorter of the two of, um, collections of Becket's miracles that were compiled in the 12th century. He was made prior of Christchurch in 1175, but he left Canterbury to become abbot of Peterborough in 1177. Benedict's collection was most likely written as a cohesive work in the early 1170s and was almost certainly completed by 1174. 
uh, Beckett's second miracle collection was written by William of Canterbury. William held a much less senior position at Christchurch than Benedict, having only been ordained a deacon by Beckett himself in 1170, shortly before the martyrdom. Um, he joined Benedict in the task of recording miracles in June 1172, when the number of miracles had become too great for one monk to manage alone. And Benedict does complain about the amount of work it's taking him to write off all these miracles in his collection. Um, but William of Canterbury seems to be a bit younger, more enthusiastic. He can't wait to write them all down. Uh, the first five books of William's collection were completed by 1175, and when a sixth book was added in 1176-7, the number of miracles came to approximately 438, which is a far larger collection than Benedict's, uh, which contains around 265 miracles. As shrine custodians, both Benedict and William had close contact with pilgrims, and part of their role may have been to tend to the sick. In 12th century England, the clergy were taking on an increasingly pastoral role, and many shrine custodians were responsive to both the spiritual and physical needs of the pilgrims in their care. Um, according to their own accounts, both miracle compilers asked questions and discussed sickness and healing with the recipients of cures. The, their collections thus provide insights into the compilers' experiences with pilgrims, as well as their own interpretations of illness and healing. Okay, so we'll take a look now at the people I've classified as mad who came to the shrine. Um, you can see they're not always described by the exact same terminology, but there's a range of terminology um, that was used from simply being insane, or several of them are described as having lost their mind. Um, a few are described as experiencing fury or frenzy, which is a kind of a quite violent form of insanity. Um, there are some possessed people, which I'll come to in a minute. And there's one, only one person who's described as experiencing a disturbance of the brain. So in all the other cases, they use the word mind as opposed to brain. Um, and in this case, it's in William of Canterbury's collection, and he's quoting a letter from another cleric who witnessed the miracle. So he wasn't the one who actually used the word brain. Um, there's also a few people who we're going to look at, but I haven't counted them in the total number, but they are, they're suffering from physical illnesses, but their screaming and wailing through pain or whatever makes people think they might be, might be bad as well. Um, perhaps surprisingly, given the connection in um, kind of the early modern period between um, madness and witchcraft and femininity, you'll see that the majority of the pilgrims who were cured of insanity were men and were adult men. So we only have a few children. Um, notably, there are no children under seven who are brought to the shrine suffering from madness, perhaps because um, the signs of madness are usually behavioural, as we'll see, and it may be hard to tell if, say, a three-year-old child is acting insanely or just having a tantrum or something that a toddler might do. Um, the fact that they're all men, we shouldn't perhaps read too much into this because the majority of um, people who receive cures from any condition in miracle collections are generally men, perhaps because it was easier for them to travel to shrines or perhaps because the clerics were more comfortable talking to men about the cures and then recording them. Um, you'll see that uh, a few people are described as being possessed by demons and we're going to talk a bit more later on about the language of demonic possession. But I'd just like to note here that it is, whilst it's fairly common, it's not the only term used to describe insanity. If we move on to the causes of madness, um, the screen might look a little bit bare. And this is because quite often the monks don't record the cause. So they just say such and such person was insane. They came to the shrine. They were cured. Um, the cause might not be given because they didn't see it was important to record it. So obviously the main purpose of recording it is to say, look how amazing Thomas Beckett was, he did this. So maybe we don't need to know what the cause was. Uh, maybe they didn't know the cause. Maybe the person who was cured didn't tell them the cause. So, but in lots of cases, the cause is not recorded. Where it is recorded, um, there are physical, mental and spiritual causes of insanity. Um, so some of the physical causes can be um, insanity induced by pain, um, various different painful conditions like childbirth, an inflamed womb, toothache, things like that. Um, one guy is struck by lightning and then goes insane. Um, 
quite understandably, possibly. <laughs> um, there are also some, what we may see as psychological, obviously not, not interpreted in that way necessarily in the Middle Ages, but um, so, for example, there's a knight who uh, is deprived of one of his properties by the Bishop of Durham, and he's so upset that he goes insane. Um, and there's also what might be seen as spiritual reasons for going insane. So one sailor refuses to make a pilgrimage to Canterbury and then is punished with insanity. And we're going to look in a minute at a possible case of fornication that may lead to insanity. So here's um, the miracle where there is a possible connection between fornication, sin and madness. This is the cure of a woman named Matilda, and it's recorded by Benedict of Peterborough. So I'm going to read you his words. We saw a foolish woman named Matilda, who was filled with a demon, and who was brought from the region of Cologne, and we were terrified of the strange madness in our presence. For instance, she tore into pieces the linen smock, the only thing that covered her body, and with unimagined strength, she struck a blow at anybody who wanted to move her away. She would have suffocated a small child who ran to meet her had he not been quickly pulled away by those standing nearby. She was bound and thus raved for four or five hours in the presence of the martyr, so that's Thomas Beckett, until he provided her her sanity. The wicked spirit was truly expelled from her, but the expulsion left behind vile traces. She then gradually returned to her normal self and the next day was wholly restored. Though her speech was scarcely intelligible to us, and we don't know whether this is because she is a, is a result of the madness or because she's from Cologne and they may not have been communicating in the same language or dialect. Um, she recalled that she had seen the martyr in her sleep, clothed in papal vestments, having a streak of blood across his face, because you can remember that his head was cut with the sword when he was martyred, um, of which we made mention in his life. So his life is the record of, Be of Beckett's kind of saintly life and death that was recorded by the same monks, actually. And asking about the nature of her illness, and then she had shown the questioner, so this is Beckett, a suffering of body and mind. Thus, he promised her sanity and imposed a journey of pilgrimage to the home of the apostles, which is Rome, or even to the church of the Blessed James. So that's the popular medieval pilgrimage destination in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Thus, he promised she would be absolved. And also, when we asked her how she had been made insane, she told us that her brother had killed a young man who had rashly loved her. And so she herself, seized with madness, had struck her baby, who had been baptised the day before, with her fist and removed it from the midst, by which he means killed it. She departed, therefore, from the martyr, healed and happy and anxious only for forgiveness for her crime. Uh, so this is one of the longest descriptions of insanity in both miracle collections, yet it seems to raise more questions than it answers. Benedict implies that Matilda of Cologne's restoration to sanity and that when she was restored, he asked her to explain what had caused her madness. She described how her brother had killed her lover and declared that this act had sent her insane. While seized by madness, so note that she's already insane when she does this, she'd struck her newly baptised baby with her fist and killed it. Um, Benedict didn't state whether it was the trauma of this experience or the potential sins of fornication and infanticide that had sent Matilda mad. Note that the man who, who was killed by her brother and was presumably the father of this baby is described as a lover and not as a husband. So there's some implication that that was an improper relationship. Uh, Matilda's insanity is also connected to the interference of a demon. Her sins could have resulted directly from demonic possession or even if they weren't demonic in their origins, um, her sinful nature could have left Matilda more vulnerable to demonic attack. In addition to its spiritual and moral connotations, which we'll come, back, um, we'll come back to the demonic element later, Matilda's madness was said to affect her body and mind. The association with, of madness with the mind does not mean that physical signs and symptoms of insanity were absent from the miracle record. Far from it, in fact. 
Um, in Matilda's case, she tore her linen dress and she attacked a small child in the cathedral, which were both visible signs of her madness. And they're kind of also reflected in the stained glass. She's also being beaten with sticks in the same way that Henry was. Um, the response, yeah, so this response to her behaviour was physical. She's bound and in the stained glass, she's beaten just like Henry. Okay, so as with causes, the signs of madness are again not always stated. Some of the miracle records are really short, just like two sentences that literally say, a woman was brought when she was insane, she was cured and she went home. That's all we got. So we don't know how they knew she was insane. Um, you can see where it is stated. Pretty much all of these um, signs of madness are physically obvious behavioural signs that someone would be able to observe in the insane person without necessarily ha having to ask them about their condition. Um, the only one that isn't observable is giddiness, which turns out actually not to be insanity, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but it's linked with insanity. Um, perhaps the most intriguing records to begin with are those in which madness is discussed, but where the diagnosis of the condition requiring miraculous cure is ambiguous. So Benedict of Peterborough described the illness of a seven-year-old boy called Herma, who was, quote, suddenly struck with an astonishing suffering, having recovered from a previous sickness. Benedict's use of the word astonishing demonstrates his uncertainty about how to diagnose this condition, as well, of, as, of course, as emphasising Beckett's um, skill in curing it. Uh, the strange illness, which presented as a constant rotation of the hands, arms and head, made the boy, quote, appear to be insane. So it doesn't say he is insane, it says appear to be. And this insane appearance made it seem as though the boy's mind had been taken but we don't actually know if it had conclusively. Um, similarly, in another miracle record, a man called William Patrick was suffering from toothache. He flung his limbs about and shouted in pain. Um, because these were signs that could also be associated with insanity, William was thought to be mad and was placed in chains. It was only with hindsight, presumably when he explained the cause of his strange behaviour, that his true ailment, which was cured by Thomas Beckett, could be diagnosed. And so note that these behaviours only seem to be associated with insanity when there's no reasonable cause for them. So if you're doing this and then there's a perfectly reasonable explanation, it's not madness. But if there's no reason for it, it can be associated with madness. Uh, two records in William of Canterbury's collection reveal a degree of correspondence between madness and the symptomatically similar condition of epilepsy. Unusual movement of the head and limbs could be a sign of both ailments. However, um, whilst the two conditions could present similar symptoms and could sometimes be the subject of comparison, the distinctions noted in these very comparisons show that they were quite clearly perceived as different conditions. Um, so, for example, a priest called William, who was suffering from giddiness, this is the case I mentioned earlier, um, feared that he could, be, he could either be inflicted with madness or epilepsy. Um, either could have caused the giddiness, but he thought, felt that they were different things. Um, another William, and I apologise now that there are a lot of Williams <laughs> in the upcoming accounts, another William um, from St Albans, suffered for three months with alienation or stupor of the mind. And he was cured by St. Alban after beatings from his friends and words intended to calm him, not sure if they were administered at the same time, um, had no effect. Sometimes after his cure, uh, sometime after his cure, he developed a tremor of the hand and falling sickness, with which he was afflicted for nine years, falling every week. Nonetheless, there's no indication of beatings or attempts to calm him during this time, suggesting that his friend's reaction to epilepsy differed from their reaction to madness. William's epilepsy was diagnosed entirely based on his physical symptoms without any reference to the state of his mind. William of Canterbury, who's the miracle compiler, um, used the term the falling sickness, which is indicative of the close relationship between the diagnosis, diagnosis of epilepsy and its physical symptoms. When compiling his miracle collection, William of Canterbury had opted for a thematic approach, um, grouping his healing miracles by illness. 
Notably, he placed um, epilepsy miracles and madness miracles in separate sections, and they're actually nowhere near each other either, so he didn't even make a link there. Uh, whilst the aforementioned William of St. Albans miracle was grouped with other epilepsy miracles, because that's the condition that Thomas Beckett cured him of, um, the miracle of William, the giddy priest, who was never diagnosed as suffering from epilepsy or madness, uh, was placed alongside other miscellaneous records detailing the miraculous cures of clerics. There's no separate giddiness section, because there simply weren't enough cases of that to warrant its own category. Um, William of Canterbury was keen to include details of how frequently cured people who had previously had epilepsy had suffered before they came to Beckett's shrine. Uh, so Petronella, a nun with epilepsy, who was brought to Beckett's shrine by her sisters, fell nine times a day. Um, Hingram, who was a man from Italy, fell once a week, but only at night. And a canon with epilepsy, who was also called William, um, suffered for 20 years with up to a year between his seizures. Now, obviously, with epilepsy, the cessation of seizures is the way that you can tell that someone's cured. Um, so you may not obviously know instantly at the shrine that they're cured because we don't know if they're going to suffer another seizure. And um, some, there are kind of notes from the monks that they've gone out to wherever the person came from or they'd written to the local priest and said, is this person still not suffering any seizures, to check that they were still cured. Um, it, this is perhaps why it was useful for the miracle compilers to make note of how frequently the seizures had been experienced prior to cure. And also the details of the frequency of the seizures helped to show how, um, how great a cure had been performed by Thomas Beckett. So back with Henry now. Um, so, we know that epilepsy would, had been cured when people stopped suffering their seizures, but how could the monks tell when madness had been cured? Um, despite the frequent references to the visible signs of madness, in their descriptions of cures, the miracle compilers focused on the effect of the miracle on a sufferer's mental state and ability to reason. Um, Henry of Fordidge, the mad youth who we met at the beginning of this talk, was restrained during his madness but upon his cure, he was, quote, restored to reason, demonstrating that the source of his suffering lay in his mind and that it was this suffering that caused him to act insanely. Um, similarly, a young girl from Wales was, quote, restored to the way of reason as the culmination of her pilgrimage to Canterbury. Uh, Walter, a clerk from Hatcliffe, was unable to make a vow of pilgrimage to the saint because of his lack of reason when he was mad. So his friends and parents made one on his behalf. His, quote, reason was then restored and he was able to make the pilgrimage himself. Um, according to a summary of English law that was compiled during the reign of Edward I in the 13th century and probably would have been um, in place during this period, the insane were among those who were not capable of making, um, giving their consent to any kind of contract or obligation, which included vows of pilgrimage. Um, so the fact that Walter's um, ability when he's cured from madness to make a vow of pilgrimage himself is restored shows that, he, that the cure has taken place. Okay, so coming back to demons now. Um, <laughs> sure the bit you all want to hear. So the language of being restored to one's mind upon cure directly relates to some of the causes, uh, terms commonly used to describe madness itself. Um, so we have terms like taken, seized and captured which imply that a person's mind was taken against their will and allude to demonic possession even where a demon is not directly mentioned. Um, a servant of the prior of Colchester, who was called Robert, was, quote, taken by a demon and then, quote, returned to himself upon drinking Beckett's holy water. An artisan named Hardwin was simply taken and then restored to his mind by Thomas Beckett's relics. Uh, more explicitly, four women uh, were referred to as being possessed by the devil, and demons are mentioned multiple times. In total, William of Canterbury recorded nine cases of madness that were linked to demonic possession, and eight cases that were not. Benedict of Peterborough, by comparison, recorded two cases of demonic possession and six cases of non-demonic madness. So-called possessions were often accompanied by descriptions of violence, beast-like behaviour or superhuman skills. 
So a poncure, Robert, the servant of the prior of Colchester, who had been seized by a demon, reported that someone else had been in control of his hands and tongue. One woman lost the ability to eat and drink for 15 days, and a second spoke the language of demons for eight years in Latin and German. We don't know if she could speak these languages prior to her possession, or whether she also obtained the gift of tongues from the demon that possessed her. Another madman who was troubled by a demon was scorned by his community and left to roam as one of the beasts in the wild. Um, as we looked at at the beginning of this talk, uh, Matilda of Cologne, and this is her full kind of miracle window. She's got three panels where Henry only got two, um, but you can see she's kind of like him in the last one, nice and neat and praying, whereas before she's being restrained. Um, she came filled with a demon, and as part of her cure, quote, the wicked spirit was truly expelled. Nonetheless, um, aside from its interaction with Matilda, Benedict paid little attention to the physicality of the demon. Um, he doesn't describe its appearance or its movements. Um, by contrast, um, as you heard earlier, he provided a very detailed description of um, what Thomas Beckett looked like in Matilda's vision of him, right down to the streak of blood across his face. This approach is true of every single case of demonic possession in the two collections. There's not one physical description of a demon in any of the madness miracles. Um, there's also no portrayals of demons in any of the miracle windows, um, even though in other contemporary images they have kind of demons coming out of the mouths of possessed people when they're exercised. Um, and there are, by contrast, loads of depictions of Thomas Beckett flying around the tomb helping people <laughs> and things like that. Um, it was most common in both miracle collections for demons to be encountered as disembodied voices, audible only to the mad, or as non-specific figures that lurked outside the bodies of the mad. Um, before taking shelter in Beckett's tomb, and I do mean in, um, this was a slightly unorthodox case, um, a man called Elwood of Selling was said to be fleeing evil spirits that he believed he could see snarling around him. In another miracle, a child astounded his family by repeatedly crying, see where they come, see where they come, though no other members of the household could see anything, demonic or otherwise. These sufferers were those in the collections who were closest to encountering physical demons, and yet still, even in these cases, um, demons are never explicitly described as anything more than delusions in the minds of the insane. Benedict specifically does not state that demons actually followed Elwood into the cathedral. He states that Elwood believed he saw demons. Benedict was certainly aware that supposed demonic attacks could be diagnosed by physicians in this period as delusions. Stephen of Hoyland was a knight who suffered from terrifying nocturnal visions for 30 years. Um, being a knight, he had consulted demon, uh, consulted physicians about his condition, um, which he believed was caused by demons. The physicians, however, felt that the nightmares were caused by a condition called ephialtes, which is a Greek term um, for a condition that's known in Latin as incubus, um, which is where someone feels as though they're being crushed to death in their sleep. Um, in some medieval texts, incubus is connected with demons, so it's interesting that Benedict uses the Greek term, um, and he doesn't use much Greek in his collections, maybe to kind of show that these physicians were um, definitely not implying any demonic involvement. Um, of course, for, this, for a miracle to come out of this account, um, the physicians have to be ineffectual, because otherwise there would be no need to go to the saint if the physicians had already cured him. Um, so in this case, it's proved that these are demons that are haunting um, the knight, and he's um, cured by Thomas Beckett. But it does show that Beck, uh, Benedict knew that physicians could diagnose visions of demons as delusions. Um, it's possible that terms like seized or captured may have been labels used by Benedict and William to describe a set of symptoms involving violent and abnormal behaviour that was an indicative of trauma in the mind, which had been taken from the body. So Hardwin, the artisan who was restored to his mind by Beckett's relics, um, was described as seized, but there's no mentions of demons at all. Um, in Gloucestershire, it is the, quote, spirit of madness itself that drives two people out of their minds, 
um, though the enemy of the human race is also mentioned in this miracle, which could imply the involvement of the devil. Um, several cases of madness in both collections were attributed to the presence of demons, and both compilers use language pertaining to possession. Such language was used alongside other terms that etymologically pointed to a problem in the mind of the sufferer. The demons in Beckett's miracles were not physical entities, in that they were not described as taking a corporeal form, or even in the majority of cases as creating the illusion of corporeality. Um, instead, unseen demons agitated the minds of their victims through trickery and delusion. Madness, demonically induced or otherwise, was defined by its effect on the mind of the sufferer, and its effects were most often seen through unusual or even inhuman behaviour. Demoniacs could develop superhuman abilities or be prone to outbursts of spontaneous violence. It's possible, in some cases, that language associated with possession was used figuratively to describe such behaviour rather than to indicate the literal presence of a demon. Uh, the varied terminology used to describe madness in both collections is reflective of a multifaceted um, contemporary understanding of madness and of an enduring connection between madness and demonic possession. So as Benedict's question, uh, with which I open this talk, so what is easier to give health of the mind or of the body, indicates miracle compilers in 12th century England recognised a difference between corporeal and mental illness. Mental illness, or madness, was referred to by many terms, um, and as we saw in the case of Matilda of Cologne, who was described as both being filled with a demon and suffering from madness, um, it was often the case that more than one term could be used to describe the same condition. Um, despite being referred to by many terms, madness does seem to have been recognised as a distinct condition that was different from other conditions like epilepsy. The vast majority of mad people were brought to shrines for cures that displayed some, um, for conditions that displayed some form of violent or unusual behaviour, such as biting, screaming and attacking others. There was a strong association between certain behaviours, such as weeping, wailing and rolling around, and madness, so much so that people who displayed these behaviours could be compared to mad people without actually being diagnosed as mad themselves. Um, it was only when such behaviours lacked a rational explanation, such as pain or grief, that the sufferer was thought to be truly mad. The term mind seems, therefore, to have specifically referred to the cognitive and reasoning ability of a person, which was restored when they were cured from insanity. When mad people were miraculously cured, the change in their behaviour was immediately apparent. In order to demonstrate that a mad person had been cured, um, the compilers described them as being calm, quiet, wise and discreet, and that's also how they're shown in the windows. Oh, this is one of the Thomas Beckett flying around images that, you, that I mentioned earlier. From a distance of over 800 years, we cannot directly penetrate the realities of those individuals whose miraculous experiences were recorded. But we can consider how individual experience was represented. In miracle records, we can discern, discern the signs and symptoms by which madness was recognised. Sometimes we're given details concerning the individuals believed to be mad. We can see how families and communities interacted with these individuals. We can discern societal expectations of reasonable behaviour. Thomas Beckett had no difficulty curing minds as well as bodies, but as we have seen in the cases of several pilgrims who debated the causes of their own conditions, the distinctions between physical and mental illness, whilst they certainly did exist, were not always easy to discern. Thank you. Yeah? You mentioned epilepsy a lot of times. Yeah. When was that name actually given to a, a condition? Oh, um, the ancient Greeks were using epilepsy as a term, but it may not have referred to the condition we now think of as epilepsy. Um, so epilepsy was a term right back in kind of Galen ancient texts, um, but it's kind of used, what they give us the symptoms are um, kind of, it can be um, 
violent movements of the arms and the head, but it can, they also describe something as ep that's epilepsy of the stomach, which we don't really know what that is, but is that, that may not be what we would think of as epilepsy. So yeah, the term is used, there's a long precedent of the term being used, but it may not be what, what the modern condition of epilepsy is, and that it, even in these texts, we don't know if these people had what we would think was epilepsy, or whether they had, but they definitely had a condition that the miracle compilers thought was the same in each of them because they gave it the same term. Is there, is there much uh, evidence of what the monks actually themselves did around the shrine? You know, I mean, they don't go into a huge amount of detail because I think they didn't necessarily see their own role as, as that important or they didn't want to kind of show that the collection was all about them. They wanted to focus on Thomas Beckett. But where they do mention it, it sounds like they were directing pilgrims in where to go and making sure that people weren't being disruptive and doing weird things. And like um, one, one boy gets in trouble for resting his head on the tomb, which is seen as irreverent. Um, so he shouldn't do that. So it seems like they were, they were around and making sure that it wasn't getting overcrowded. Because remember at this point, they're having to go down into the crypt to visit the tomb. Um, and that's kind of why they get the ambulatory in the, when they move the shrine so that people can walk around in an orderly fashion and leave again. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the monks are there, but we don't know exactly what they're doing. But obviously they are, some of them, taking some time to talk to people after they think they've been cured as well. So we know that they're discussing things with them. Yeah, they don't want to say, and I was doing this, and it was, I, I was excellent. <laughs> that's quite, that's quite clear about how sort of modern Benedict is in you know, perhaps they expect you that people would be prepared, you know, you be prepared to see demons and say to the and make more thing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like he doesn't want to fully commit to saying they're demons, so he just says, well, this is what the guy told me he saw. Obviously, I didn't see anything, but that's what he told me. So he seems to be kind of, he doesn't seem to want to fully commit. And there is evidence of him having read contemporary medical texts about this. Um, so he had his own collection of medical texts that he brought from, from Canterbury to Peterborough when he, became, when he became abbot. Obviously, we can't categorically tell that he read them, but it is sort of likely he may at least have looked at them as they were in the collection he, he brought with him. Are, are there any other um, 12th or 13th century miracle collections which give accounts of healing mental illness? Yep, there's loads. <laughs> there's, there's another four in the book, um, but there's others across. The ones I picked for the book have quite a um, concentrated number of madness miracles, but there's also others where a couple of miracles will mention them as well. Um, so there's the, um, I don't know if you know, William of Norwich, who, whose miracles were collected at this, during this period. Um, St. Bartholomew in London has a collection of miracles where there's several mad people in them. Um, St. Ed Edmund of Berry has features, I think, five mad people in his collection, although those are cases of where madness is given as a divine punishment. Not, it's not something that's cured by the saint. It's something he dishes out. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Q of Lincoln has quite a few in his collection as well. St. Frideswide, loads of them. Yeah, it's, it's a, because I think it, it's one of the conditions that um, is engaged with in the Bible, um, kind of curing people of demons and things it's sort of a frequent trope that appears in these miracle collections that as one of the things the saints can do but, but any of the saints is curious the saints, i mean all of their compilers thought they were the best <laughs> no one seems to specifically specialize in it so some saints do specialize in a condition but no one seems to do that and obviously these compilers are show, trying to show that beckett is the best saint. For example, in the case of the, um, the William who was, he was cured of epilepsy by St. Alban. You might think, well, why would St. Alban not cure his madness? Maybe he didn't. So uh, in the miracle, St. Alban actually says, oh, you should, you should go to Thomas Beckett. He's the new guy on the block. Yeah. So you can imagine the monks at St. Alban's would think it wouldn't be agreeing <laughs> that necessarily have been said. Um, but they're kind of, they're trying to link him with these other important saints to show how great he is. And there are other collections. I think um, the collections of St. James at Reading, one of them goes to Thomas Beckett and he, he can't do it. So St. James does it instead. So they're all doing this in, in their collections. Yeah? They focus on the ones that they managed to heal. Is there any record of people who it on work or where they went or they even? 
Um, so obviously these are very scarce because the compiler doesn't want to say such and such came to Canterbury and Thomas Beckett didn't do anything. So, <laughs> so the only cases, we, uh, there's only a few cases across all the collections. One is where the madness is given as a punishment. Um, some of those people do die from the, from the madness that's given as a punishment. Um, so one sheriff um, is inflicted by madness um, with madness by St. Edmund of Bury, and he ends up dying. And they're still so scared that he's going to be mad post-death that they, bury, they tie up his body in a calf skin and bury it in a lake so that he can't come back up and carry on being mad. Um, so yes, there are the, the cases where, where that's what the saint wanted to happen, so that's why they died. Um, and there's a couple of the old cases, obviously, where in one collection they say, oh, such and such saint didn't cure them, so they came to us and then they were cured. Um, but there aren't really, there's no, we, there could have been thousands more than we actually know about. So we, obviously, we imagine lots of people are going to these shrines and not getting a cure. Um, and then the monks didn't want to write that down. So we don't have a record of those people. Great. Thank you.